Welcome to Candidates of Liberty, a special series from Lions of Liberty dedicated to spotlighting libertarian candidates across the country. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another edition of Candidates of Liberty here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. And today I am here with a candidate for the New Hampshire State Senate. Very pleased to welcome Miss Carla Garrick. Carla, are you ready to roar? I am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, now, Carla, this program aims to highlight libertarian candidates and campaigns around the country. And your situation is somewhat unique as you are. Yeah, I believe you formerly first ran as a Republican, but you are also the official candidate of the Libertarian Party as well. And we'll discuss how that all came about in just a bit. But first, I know you've been heavily involved in, in the Free State Project for a long time. Why don't you just start by telling us how you became a libertarian philosophically and uh, tell us a little bit about your work with the Free State Project. Sure. So, I mean, I think philosophically, I was sort of born a rebel. <laughs> I came, uh, I was originally born in South Africa, and I grew up under the apartheid regime. So even as sort of a young person, and certainly as a law student, I knew there was something fishy going on, right? You know, we had these weird government controls and all of that. So I was a small time anti apartheid activist. Uh, while I was at law school. After I immigrated to America, I worked as a lawyer in Silicon Valley. So it was always sort of on the business side of things. But then, honestly, when I went through the internet bubble, so sort of the boom and the bust, and and um, that's really where I started doing way more research. Like I was really curious, how did I go from, you know, massages at my, my desk, <laughs> um, you know, on the 31st floor of downtown San Francisco to getting um, laid off. And uh, so I sort of started with the business cycle. And then from there up, obviously found Austrian economics and actually from there found the Free State Project. And I'm a very practical person. I like, you know, I, I subscribe to the human action kind of ethos of life. And so I was like, this sounds really cool. We should go check out New Hampshire. And um, I, I was living in New York at the time. I actually decided not to be a lawyer anymore, went back to school, got the most useless degree in the history of mankind, meaning a master's in fine arts and creative writing. <laughs> And then uh, started, you know, from New York, coming up to New Hampshire, checking it out. My husband and I were both like, do we think we could be happy there? And then, you know, moved up in a blizzard in 2008. Don't recommend. <laughs> <laughs> and, Great timing. Yeah. And then, you know, I got involved initially as a volunteer. I organized Pork Fest for a few years. That's the Porcupine Freedom Festival. Oh, yeah. We, we had a blast at Pork Fest last year. Awesome. And then... Um, and then in 2011, uh, became the president of the organization. And as I said, I'm, you know, goals driven. And I was like, we got to trigger the move. We got to get more people up here. So, you know, sort of set about coming up with a plan, worked with a lot of brilliant people. And we triggered the move in 2016. And I had said always, you know, I, I'm going to stand down once I've done it, because I don't always think that having people in the same roles, you know, it's the same argument we see with term limits. I was mm -hmm. like, I got to get out of here. I got to go do some other stuff. And uh, so I ran for Senate against Lou D'Alessandro in, um, in uh, 2016 as well. Now this dude is, he's 80 years old. He's a 20, you know, he's been in the Senate for 20 years. He's never held a job that was not state related. He was a football coach and a teacher and then just, you know, a, a statist. And um, the first time around, I got 40 percent of the vote, which I felt pretty good about. Especially uh, against a lifelong, basically incumbent. Yeah, exactly. And so I was like, okay, I didn't take you last time, but maybe I can do it this time. And I, I got out early. I've, I've fundraised enough money to like put up a credible fight. I'm getting all kinds of fancy stuff. And then, um, you know, and door knocking and I got volunteers out and, and doing outreach and really, you know, getting beyond, I would say, just the liberty activist bubble, right? You got to get you know, my district's huge. I have to get thousands of people to vote for me. And, you know, lo and behold, if they meet me, they actually like me. So, um, so I've been out there working hard and the, the word on the street is they, they think, I might win. So I'm cautiously optimistic, Ooh. but you know, don't hold it against me if I don't, but I'm going to say I gave it more than a college <laughs> try. <laughs> 
Very cool. Now, so why did you decide to originally run as a Republican back in 2016? Was it just what you saw as the, the better path to be able to actually, you know, win that office? Whereas uh, we all know the pitfalls and the difficulties of running, you know, as a third party. Yeah, I mean, of course, we do know the challenges of a third party um, campaign. Uh, you know, the, the the Republican platform in New Hampshire is actually pretty good. You know, it's, it's free markets, free people, free enterprise. It's, uh, you know, I mean... Not, None of them really vote according to the platform. But, oh, of course not. But, but you know, I, I, I was like, if I'm going to do this and I'm going to run as a Republican. And honestly, the Libertarians didn't have ballot access in 2016. Libertarian Party got ballot access in the same race that um, that I um, you know, ran in the first time when I lost. Well, that, that's actually really interesting because you got 40 percent and there's also that other percentage that got enough votes to help the Libertarians. So I guess maybe that's part of what you're doing here, hoping to combine all of that. that I mean, that's what I'm hoping to do. I really do hope it doesn't come back and bite me in the butt because, you know, my name's going to the way it works in New Hampshire. Um, and maybe I should just explain this, too. So basically what happened sure, yeah. was, you know, we had the primary. My primary was uncontested. But of course, people came out and voted anyway. But because the Libertarian Party had ballot access for the first time, um, people were really excited to be able to vote for the people they actually believe in. There was no one listed for me. So um, supporters started a write-in campaign. They wrote me in. Um, and then the Secretary of State did not count the write-ins. So I may be the first person in history who filed for and won a recount for a party I wasn't even running under. And now <laughs> I'm on both sides of the ballot. So. That's pretty wild. That's pretty wild. So it was a purely a write-in campaign and that, that was there originally another victor that was declared? No. So what they did is in Ward 11, where I live in West Manchester, um, where actually a lot of porcupine Pines, which is like, you know, our colloquial name for, for free right. skaters, um, live in this neighborhood. So I was pulled standing and people were coming out and they were like, hey, I wrote you in for, you know, the libertarian <laughs> candidate. You're like, you did? And there were enough <laughs> where I was like, wow, this might actually, you know, happen. And you have to get 35 write-ins in order to be considered. So I was at the polling station when they were closing and the moderator announced you got 30 write-ins. And I remember my, my feeling sort of being disappointment. I was like, oh, I missed the, the 35. Okay, whatever. But then um, people wrote me in all over my district. This was just one ward. And so mm -hmm. when she said 30, then when the count came out, they said there was only one write-in. And I was like, look, something's fishy. Like, but you know, in, in New Hampshire, after a fight, it's now legal to take ballot selfies, right? So everyone was taking a selfie with their ballot to be able to right. prove they wrote me in. So I actually had like backup and the whole thing. So I filed for the recount. And of course, their position was, oops, you know, I don't think it was malicious. I think it's just rank incompetence, to be honest. But I think now they realize, hey, hey, we're watching and you guys need to do your job better. So do you think there was like shenanigans in the first place that they didn't want you to have that, that nomination as well or more just incompetence and people not really caring to count them? Yeah, I think actually what happened was um, there, there were two people who were written in on, on the Ward 11 ballots. So there were 29 for me and there was one for some other dude. And um, when they did the tally, I think they put my name, one his name won, meaning there were write-ins for those. I mean, it doesn't really make sense to me. This is how they explained mm -hmm. it. And then when that tally went to the Secretary of State, it just said she got one write-in. Um, so there was definitely, definitely a disconnect somewhere. I mean, there were also right. issues with ballot access. Because it was the first time the Libertarian Party had access, They, you could actually even though it was a primary race, which is, you know, Dems go vote for Dems and Republicans vote for Republicans, you could actually say, I want to vote Libertarian this time, regardless of what party you were in, because it was the first time. And right. uh, people try to do that in several wards and, and across the state were like, no, you can't vote Libertarian if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Because they just didn't know because it was the first time. So there's confusion. Yeah. You know, I mean, I always I, I always subscribe, you know, I always sort of go to it. It's just stupidity and, and incompetence over 
evil because, you know, sometimes I'm like, I don't even think they're smart enough to be that evil. <laughs> <laughs> Once you meet enough of them, you realize, okay, they're not really manipulating anything. No, you know, and, 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 you know, I mean, a lot of these moderators and stuff, you know, they're, they're, they're elderly, they're there for, you know, 20 hours, they're tired. Um, and you know, it's, it's new to them. So I certainly think for this time, there's, you know, there, there, you know, we would, we had a talk with the secretary of state and they said, okay, they're going to do better. But I've already heard stories that, that, you know, each, each ward has a different ballot, that there are a bunch of mistakes all over the place on all the ballots as well. So I don't know. How do you find yourself connecting uh, with voters in New Hampshire? What, what are the main issues you're able to connect with people on? Because obviously, you know, so many people, libertarians especially, connect New Hampshire with the Free State Project. Uh, you know, it's a, the, uh, live free or die is the motto. It seems like a state most inclined to libertarianism. But, uh, you know, in, at least on the national level, they still, you know, give us Donald Trump, give us uh, Bernie Sanders as, as victors in those races. So uh, obviously most people are not fully libertarian in the sense that we might like. So how are you able to connect with people? And, and what are the issues that you find people agree? with you the most on you know uh, when i go door to door the number one question i would say i get is where are you on trump you know so 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 there are a lot of people here who are heavy trump supporters i always say you know i never lie i'll say you know i i agree with well actually i'm like trump's presidency is like a western there's the good (laughs) the bad and the ugly right (laughs) that's a good way to put it because yeah i think that's pretty accurate and you know i'm like (laughs) Look, I agree with you on the deep state. Uh, I agree with him on the deep state. I, um, you know, I think there's fake news out there and I'm enjoying the show. Um, so there's definitely that, that sort of camp. And I think there are a lot of Trumpers who are actually seeking answers and who are, who are looking past the sort of left-right paradigm that we've all been forced into. Um, gun rights is important to some people. Of course, New Hampshire now has constitutional carry, so there's really not much work in terms of liberalizing our gun laws. Laws, but there is work to do to stop the gun grabbers and gun control and, you know, all the laws they want to bring in. Um, taxes, you know, I, my, my district is quite urban on the one side and quite rural on the other with lots of small business owners. Um, everyone's concerned about property taxes. People care about school choice. We're, we're making some good inroads here in terms of school choice and um, uh, I education savings account bill actually got sort of stopped in the Senate. So if I do win, when I win, then um, we're, I think we'll get that passed. And that will probably make it so that the, the money can follow the child. And then you can pick from, you know, a, a public school and there are great public schools here, but you know, there's always room for improvement, public schools, charter, Uh, private or even parochial. And, you know, obviously that's going to end up being a fight in the Supreme Court, but that's the the direction we want to move in. And for homeschooling kids, I'm like, I don't even have kids, right? And our only big tax here is property taxes because we don't have a sales tax. We don't have an income tax. And honestly- That sounds sounds heavenly to me because- I'm in California, yeah. so I have all of that. <laughs> I used to live there, right? I empathize. <laughs> yeah, you, you know all too well. But um, but the sales tax and the income tax actually has sort of become a bit of a, a, a ground fight as well because there are lots of people on the left who are just running openly um, on on a platform of, hey, you know what we should do? We should have a sales tax and an income tax. And I'm like, I don't think Granite Staters are going to go for that. I mean, you know, that's one of the reasons we're, we're quite prosperous as compared to other states and why we have this great quality of living is because we have a government that actually has to live within its means because, you know, they, they got to come to us each time and say, Give us the money for this program. And once the once the taxes start coming, once the sales tax creeps in, it's never going to be enough. It'll start at two percent. I mean, in California, it's it's gone up several times since I moved here. Uh, you know, about twelve years ago. So I mean, once it once it starts trickling in, they're always going to want more for the next new big project. Yeah, and honestly, I, I like to use Connecticut as an example as I talk to people because in Connecticut, they you know they trick people by saying, "Hey, we can you know we can cut your property taxes if we just do this income tax." Now, you know, both have gone up. The property tax is as high as it's ever been. And the income tax is over 7% in less than a decade. 
And all the rich people, because they, they, in their genius, also gave us a millionaire's tax. And uh, so, you know, people were like, I'm going to leave. And they're, and a lot of them, I hope, are coming to New Hampshire. I know about some of them who are coming here. But, you know, they're, they're bringing their businesses. They're bringing their jobs. And I'm like, bring it. Bring it to the Granite State. We want those people. Now, you actually grew up in Connecticut, uh, you know, for, for a majority of my life before I moved here. And I, I, I remember when it happened because my dad was complaining about it. He was like, I can't believe they're bringing an income tax. And it, was, it was a whole big, you know, kerfuffle. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I can't believe they get away with it. So that's the one thing I tell everyone because it's a understandable example of don't fall for their lies. <laughs> All right. Now, Carla, if you are elected to the New Hampshire State Senate, I know you mentioned some of the issues that, that are kind of cropping up in New Hampshire. But are there any specific uh, measures you would try, you would personally be looking to push forward or maybe more likely, in your case, laws you'd be looking to repeal? Yeah, I definitely want to go the repeal route. I mean, I'm happy to co-sponsor bills and there are some interesting things that that can be done. Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent. I think the war on drugs was an abject failure. New Hampshire actually has not passed recreational. We do have medical. Um, I might, I might do this just because it, it sounds like fun and shenanigans from my end. <laughs> but the medical marijuana bill here only has specific qualifying events, and so I was like, what if we make one of the qualifying conditions free will? So, <laughs> ooh, ooh, because sneaky, I would sneaky. like to have that discussion, you know, at the legislature where they have to argue you do not have free will. <laughs> um, so that's <laughs> that what, would be a fun one to watch play you out. Know, so that one's sure. more just playful and, and unlikely that I would probably do it. Who knows? Maybe I will as a reward for winning. But um, but yeah, you know, half the point of a libertarian being in office is to actually repeal laws and actually make things better. But the other half of the point is to get a different conversation going and to change the way people are talking about things. So I think that's one area where, uh, you know, that, that could happen. And, you know, and honestly, you'd be shocked at how easy that is. I've been doing uh, Senate media training with uh, sitting senators and other Republican senators who are running. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like fast fire questions and you have to respond and come up with something pithy and quotable and all that stuff. And initially I was kind of intimidated because I was trying to sort of sound like they sounded, although sticking to my principles. And then after the first night, I was like, I'm not doing that again. I'm just going to go, I'm going to be myself. I'm going to speak my truth and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. And so I went and, and the questions where it was my opportunity to go first, it was amazing to me how all of them's answers changed into free market principled answers. And I was like, wow, so that could really truly be a value to bring so that we can change that conversation. Because when people hear our ideas, it resonates. It's a very sort of natural way to be because, you know, freedom is kind of awesome. <laughs> Right. It's, it's kind of awesome. That's why we do what we do here. Uh, Carla, I got one little curveball I'm going to throw towards you here. I'm wondering if there's any one libertarian position or n not necessarily a position per se, or maybe a viewpoint or a strategy that you sometimes find yourself disagreeing with other libertarians on. Good question. I mean, I guess oh, something that did surprise me recently is it's the sort of open borders, closed borders thing that seems to be dividing libertarians more than mm -hmm. it really should. You know, I feel like it's, it's, primarily a distraction and honestly if we look at it economically if you do away with the welfare um, state then it's not a problem right people I'm an immigrant so you know obviously I, <laughs> I'm sort of for people who, who can you know have the freedom but you need to come work so maybe that one um, I don't know good trick question <laughs> It is a trick question. <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, I don't know, I guess. I don't, I don't think any libertarian would disagree with this. Is I wish Ron Paul had won. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I, well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> Occasionally you find some anti-Ron Paul libertarians, but, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to talk about them right now. <laughs> well, Carla, it's been so much fun having you on the show. I'm really excited about your campaign, especially seeing that you had so much success two years ago, and now you have the support of the Libertarian Party, hopefully, as well, as along with Republicans and all those connections that you made over the last two years, hopefully coming together and hopefully having you achieve victory and having a great Libertarian in the New Hampshire State Senate. So certainly wish you the best of luck. Uh, before I let you go, why don't 
Ignatius, do your uh, do your little plugs and let everybody know where they can find your website, how they can find out more about your campaign, and how they can help you here in the, in the last coming weeks of the uh, the election. All right. So um, you can find out more about my race at Carla4, with the number 4, nhsenate.com. That's C-A-R-L-A-4, nhsenate.com. People who want to uh, donate, please go to that site. You can donate online or send me checks. Um, I, I feel pretty satisfied with the fundraising I did. I mean, I raised tw- just over 20000 which actually put me in the category of you might be a legitimate candidate, but you'd be surprised how fast that money goes. And my opponent is going to be attacking me, so I need money for mailers. So people who can give, please give. Um, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, my name, Carla Garrick, and um, there's a Carla Garrick for NH Senate web page, uh, Facebook page that you can look at. And other than that, you know, I, I just, I'm really excited. I mean, you know, I have this sort of, wow, maybe, maybe I will win, you know, and, and I'm trying to manifest it and I'm working really hard. Um, but I promise to serve with, uh, true integrity, character, and compassion. So I hope people will support me and I hope we have a great story to tell on November 7th. All right, Carla. Well, I wish you all the best of luck. Keep up the great work. Keep on roaring. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, friends. And that is a wrap. Not just on this interview that you heard with Miss Carla Garrick, who we wish the best of luck a week from now with her election and uh, from the sounds of it it looks like she is uh, one of the one of the elections out there for libertarians that has a strong chance of victory not not to predict it but it's it's certainly in the margin of error based on uh, you know her last election and a lot of the support she's been able to gather both with the Republican and Libertarian Party so a very unique situation definitely encourage you to check out Carla Garrick but uh, in the meantime I want to inform you that this is the last episode of at least of this run of Candidates of Liberty as I mentioned last week uh, this is show, the fate of the show, is really going to be entirely up to the feedback from the audience. If you guys want to hear from more candidates like this in the future, let us know. There are many ways you can give us feedback. You can email me directly, Mark. M-A-R-C at lionsofliberty.com. You can tweet to us at Lions of Liberty. You can come on over to our Facebook. Uh, our Facebook forum is called the Lions of Liberty Forum. If you just type that in, that's an entirely public Facebook group. It's, it's a private group, but we let anybody into it, basically, if they're a fan of the show, as long as you don't seem like a spam bot of some kind or a Nigerian prince. Uh, not that I have anything against actual Nigerian princes, but as you know, they're not always uh, what they say they are. Uh, but we will uh, you know, return to the issue of the candidates. Obviously, once these elections take place. I, I want to do some kind of podcast, sort of at least following up on the results uh, with some of the candidates that I brought on over the last few months, as well as uh, John and Brian. We all chipped in to make this show happen, largely we because we met so many amazing people at the Libertarian National Convention as well as at Porkfest. So many people who were Libertarian Party activists and candidates, and we really wanted to provide a platform for them and help their voices get out there a little bit more. So this was very much an experiment uh, with Candidates of Liberty, and I hope you all seem to have enjoyed it. We are getting a lot of positive feedback, both from listeners and from candidates. So we are very excited uh, with what we've heard so far about the show. But uh, we're definitely, I guess I'll just say it's fate is up in the air and leave it at that. Of course, one way to show that you love it, to show that you want us to do more programming like this, is to join our Patreon. Because... That is how we are able to go to events like the LNC, like Porkfest, that inspired this podcast in the first place. And, of course, we are putting the extra time and effort in to do this program and put it out there for free to the public. So anything you're able to contribute to us, as little as $5 a month can get you into the Lions of Liberty Pride, which means you'll get access to all of our bonus audio. Believe it or not, in addition to Candidates of Liberty and the three shows we do every week, myself on Mondays with great interviews with Libertarian leaders, Brian McWilliams on Wednesdays with Electric Liberty Land, and his look at comedy, culture, and liberty. And of course, John wraps things up every Friday with his look at the broken criminal justice system on Felony Friday. All great reasons to subscribe to Lions of Liberty. And we've been doing this candidate show in addition to all that. So that is all free for the public. But we have a ton of extra content that we produce for our Patreon subscribers. We do the Conspiracy Corner show. Uh, Brian, Odie, and Rico do Degenerate Gamblers, which is about 2% about gambling and 98% about ridiculous stories from our college days. Uh, we also have the League of Liberty, which I do with my friends Roger Paxton, Chris Spangle of We Are Libertarians, who has recently zucked on Facebook. So... 
please do support our good friend Chris Spangle in his in his current exile, as well as Johnny Adams of Blast Off. So we are happy to bring you all of this extra programming, and you can get access to all of it, as well as support the current work we are doing for as little as five dollars a month. So please do check out our Patreon over at patreon.com slash lions of liberty. Until next time, and I don't know when next time is gonna be on this particular format. But when it is, you can be darn sure we're going to be roaring for liberty. And until then, live long and live free.